The Paycheck Protection Programme reopened Monday morning, the same day that the Small Business Administration disclosed data, including names of companies that got larger bailout loans, sparking scrutiny uh, over the weekend that happened as well. Neil Borowski was Special Inspector General for the TARP back in 2008 as the economy was in meltdown. He's currently a partner at Jenner and Block and he joins us now for a little more scrutiny into another programme to try to save the economy. Neil, first off, what grade would you give the PPP as it's been uh, handled by banks so far? Oh, that's a tough one. I think, you know, it, it's it, the, the reason why I think it's hard to give a, a letter grade is that in some ways the program has been very successful, right? It has saved a lot of small businesses that otherwise would have failed. And for a lot of that impact, especially for from the perspective of those companies, it gets an A. But from an oversight perspective, from a fraud perspective, from the perspective of, you know, taxpayer money only being used in the way that the, the, the framers of this law originally intended, it's probably closer to a D. Yeah, we'll get into that in a little bit. So you have the likes of food cart vendors, Carnegie Hall, the Guggenheim, you know, libertarian groups, the Church of Scientology, all applying to the same program. Should they all be given equal sort of status there? Well, you know, I think it's, it's tricky, right? I mean, there are certain gating criteria for the program, uh, certain types of industries that weren't supposed to receive funds, you know, hedge funds, lobbyists, and it looks, at least from the list that put out, that some of those those companies that at least technically may have looked to be ineligible got funds, and so that's that's a problem. Uh, but it's also supposed to go to companies that needed the money. Now, I'm not talking about you know they were on the on the bricks about to go to bankruptcy, but some of the recipients read it on this list, and again, we don't know their internal finances. It really seems unlikely that a, a you know a law firm that pays its uh, partners on the average of two, three, four million dollars per partner really needed these funds uh, and nonetheless took it. And so it, it's kind of hard to know without the details, but it does look like that it wasn't really as, as evenly played um, as it should have been. If the spirit of the law, though, is to keep people employed, what's the problem with these companies and these organizations taking money alongside you know, food card vendors and very, very small business owners that only hire one or two? Well, if they didn't qualify for the program, then they violated the law by applying and, and, and taking those funds. So that's that's sort of one. But two, I think there is an ethical component to this and uh, and one that just sort of reeks of hypocrisy, right? If, if a law firm, for example, or a company knows that they don't need these funds, that they're able to continue, you know, our firm didn't take any government money, we haven't been laying people off, um, you know, because we, you know, in part, because we know that hey, you know, we don't necessarily, from an ethical perspective, need the money, even though, of course, hey, it's nice to have a couple of million dollars of free government money. But there's an ethical component there as well. And then there's the hypocrisy. You know, these anti-government, anti-quote-unquote handout uh, organizations and nonprofits, you know, who, 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 you know, go on and on about how evil the government is for, for helping people and handing it out. And we have to have small government. It, you know, finding out that they are first in line with the tin cup out to take free money, uh, it's pretty disgraceful, uh, yeah. even if it's not illegal. So I, I did want to ask you about that. We did have several sort of high-profile libertarian-type organizations, you know, like the Americans for Tax uh, Reform Foundation, the Ayn Rand Foundation, or the Ayn Rand Institute of Santa Ala, California, as well, taking money. Now, they did keep people employed, obviously, but, it, it, you know, and they're... Their reasoning was that, well, the government shut us down, therefore this is reparations. Now, tell us why that's problematic. The federal government really didn't shut down anything, did it? Yeah, you know, you, you hear that, right? And it, it sounds like a bunch of malarkey. I mean, uh, does this mean that they're now supporting the idea that if the government takes away business or something that they're always in favor of getting money? Do they believe in reparations for, for, for descendants of slaves under that theory? I mean. It, it's not. It just shows you that these, you know, these these uh, these nonprofits, you know, what is the price to sell their soul and their beliefs? Apparently, it's about one hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars. The range at which uh, some of these got this this money. It, it's just greed, right? It's just greed and and hypocrisy. And, and again, does it violate the program rules? No, uh, but you know, it, it really does call into question. And it also brings into the. It shows you the importance of transparency in these programs. And. Look, a lot of these these recipients didn't think the day would come when they would be exposed because the Treasury Secretary, I think he said that it would never happen. Uh, but under pressure and lawsuits, it has. And, and, you know, when you have transparency, you deter 
again, not, not necessarily that, that they did anything illegal, but the unethical, the hypocrites. And maybe that helps keep them out. Maybe they'll have some sense of shame, uh, which is why it's so important. And look, we only have, we have less than 20% of the recipients that have been disclosed. There's still a lot of other entities out there that we don't know about uh, because of this, this, this um, opposition to transparency. And so it's, it's why it's so important as these programs go on. Uh, taxpayers have a right to know what's happening to their money. I've been saying that now for almost 12 years, and it's still just as true now as it was in 2008. Neil, given that this needed to be done quickly, and I mean, you never know these days, there was the possibility that nothing would have actually gotten done at all and that people would have literally been starving as many were anyway. How would you have instigated very quick oversight? Oh, look, I, let me be very clear. This program on Annette, as I said in the, in the opening, it, you know, has been a has been godsend. And it wouldn't have had the impact that it did if it had very tight anti-fraud provisions on it um, and, you know, and had all these different types, types of screening mechanisms. Uh, I am very sympathetic to the fact that they had to get the money out quickly to as many companies as possible. You know, from an oversight perspective, I would say a couple of things. First of all, transparency from day one so that you can adjust the, 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 the policy and the implementation of the program as it goes on. When you have transparency and you have oversight, you can learn things. So if you see that there are classes of recipients that are inconsistent with the spirit of the rules, you can amend the rules as you go along uh, and tighten certain things up. Also, you need to have strong oversight from day one, just from a deterrence perspective. When, if everyone knew from day one, you will be disclosed. That sunlight is the best disinfectant, you know, and, and it can help chase away potentially. Now, look, there are some that are just going to be shameless. When you see that members of Congresses have, have applied for this program, when you see that cabinet level officials, family members are participating, uh, these people are, are likely immune to shame, uh, but it seems like, you know, others who maybe don't necessarily need the money or it's not appropriate get chased away. And, and just transparency does so much good when it comes to government programs. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, what we could put into place now. Uh, I mean, obviously, there was, so, there was a lot of confusion over oversight, right? There was an oversight board and then there wasn't and then there suddenly was again. But now the program is open again. Um, you know, what would be the one or two sort of things that could be done? Should there be a SAR, for example? Well, for one thing, as I said, there should be 100 percent transparency. There should be commitment that every recipient of this program is identified with the precise terms of, of their loans, um, that that should all be made public and available to taxpayers. It's their money. They have a right to know that. Um, second, you can further empower and resource the oversight agencies to make sure that they are out there they're providing the level of deterrence and investigations for those that are abusing these programs. You know, we still don't have a, you know, a, a, a full head of that oversight commission after President Trump fired Glenn Fine, uh, the PRAC as it's called, and we, we only have an acting chair. We need to have a permanent chair, and we need to protect our, 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 over, our, our overseers. You know, the fact that President Trump has fired four inspectors generals in rapid succession uh, puts a chill over the entire watchdog um, community. And so passing the type of legislation that's been proposed that will protect them from indiscriminate determination uh, because they're just simply doing their jobs, that's other ways that we can have the right types of protections as more money gets pushed out. Um, and we really need independent, fierce watchdogs keeping their eye on our money. Neil, what's your sense on whether it's fair that portfolio companies of private equity firms, you know, had, had their, you know, absolute brothers at this program as well, you know, things like you know, some small offices, dentists, you know, specialist doctors and so on. I remember when Bill Ackman came out and basically said, look, these portfolio companies are going to zero and it was sort of panic stations and, and now they've all been rescued, but they already had their their protector, their private equity umbrella, right? Were they also eligible? Should private equity have gotten sort of this quote unquote bailout here? Well, there were affiliation rules that the SBA had that were supposed to limit, you know, how much the portfolio companies could get because their employees are, you know, the 500 employee count includes all the different portfolio companies in a, in a private equity portfolio if the private equity has, you know, controlling interest over, over, over the company. So there was some built-in protections there. And look, you know, the fact that it, there's private equity behind it doesn't necessarily mean that that company otherwise would have laid off, you know, their entire workforce during the shutdown. And, and there, if the company, you know, if they otherwise qualify, and that was sort of the decision-making process, you know, I have, I have much less of a problem with it. I really don't. 
um, again, assuming all the rules were, fo were followed, yes. um, you know, it's better to have those people employed than laid off. And that was sort of the idea behind this program. So, so in those instances, don't bother me as much, again, assuming that all the rules were followed.